Hey folks, Matt Easton here, of course, of Scholar Gladiatoria. So let's have a little bit of a chat about the afterblow. Now, I understand this topic is mostly for people engaged in HEMA, perhaps even modern fencing or other martial arts. And it may be of limited interest to those of you who aren't actively involved in fencing or, or competing. But that being said, it might be interesting to you because it relates to how we judge fighting skills in a competitive environment. Now, before I get properly into this topic, I want to start by highlighting the fact that, of course, whenever you make rules for a combative um, sport, whenever you create a sport, people will perform to the rules. So whatever you make the rules, people will find ways to try and win to those rules. So this is one of the things we have to live with, and, and we try in HEMA to get around that issue, by that problem, by not having one unified rule set. There are some people who are opposed to this because they say if we ever want to be uh, recognised on a larger scale, perhaps even Olympic sport, that type of thing, then we have to have a unified, agreed set of rules. But there is a very good reasoning for not having one set of rules, and that is exactly that, because as soon as you make one set of rules, people start to exploit the details of the rules and you get further and further away from what the original point of the rules were. And the right of way rule in um, foil fencing is a good example of that. More abused, I would say, probably in sabre than it is in um, foil necessarily. But quite simply, it makes sense on paper. On paper, right of way or the rule of priority makes absolute sense. You can't attack someone, you can't hit someone and score a point until you have dealt with, defended against, or somehow avoided their attack against you. So if they attack you and you just go, ah, wiggle my weapon, and you hit each other, they get the point because they attacked first. You shouldn't, you had no place just randomly attacking them without uh, attempting not to get hit yourself first. So on paper, the right of way rule makes sense, but there are various ways to abuse the rule, which I won't go into here. Um, that's a, really a sport fencing thing. But um, the fact of the matter is that sometimes rules can make perfect sense on paper, but as soon as you throw them into a competitive environment, or at least you have them in a competitive environment for a certain amount of time, people find ways to abuse those rules. So what I really want to talk about is the afterblow. So what is the afterblow? Quite simply, it's the blow that is given after you were hit. Now, why would we allow that? Well, in the early days of HEMA, we quite simply had rules that were fairly similar to EPE rules. That is, the first person who hits gets the point. If you hit second, you get nothing. Now, there is a certain nice simplicity to that rule. Um, if something's a double, then you replay the point. If the person hits first, they get a point. But, there is a problem with that, okay? There's a problem that it encourages a type of behaviour, suicidal kamikaze behaviour, that we don't really want in a martial art. So if you teach someone, as in epee fencing, that all they need to do is hit a fraction of a second before the other person, uh, even if it's half a second before the other person, then what they will inevitably do a lot of the time is charge in. They might be aiming at a toe, they might be aiming at a hand um, with complete disregard for protecting their chest or their head or whatever. Okay, more important targets that are more likely to lead to immediate death or incapacitation. So quite simply, the afterblow was introduced. I, was, I say introduced, it does feature in historical rules. We didn't just come up with it from nowhere. But it's mentioned in historical rules that, uh, for example, if a person hits you, you have, for example, one, two, or three steps, even, to try and hit them back. Now, what this is trying to simulate is that when you wound someone with a sword in combat, you never really know what the effects of that wound, what that strike, whether it be a thrust or a cut, or a pommel or anything else, you don't know what the effect is going to be, okay? You could stab someone in the chest and they may drop down dead. You could stab someone in the chest and they might be more or less fine, okay? Same is true of cuts in the head, cuts in the arms, legs. You never really know if a cut is going to go through clothing or what effects it's going to have on the body. A thrust, 
can um, be completely uh, you know lethal with one point if it goes through the right internal organ but if it misses one of those vital internal organs much the same as a gunshot that person might be functional for minutes to come or perhaps forever they might be fine so what the afterblow is there to do is to teach people to hit without being hit and get out again without being hit. In other words, on paper, the afterblow is teaching you a perfect behaviour. It's teaching you to keep yourself covered, to hit an opponent without being hit at the same time, and then to come out or close in or whatever, whatever you want to do without being hit after you've hit them. Ideally, in an ideal situation, you could go in, not get hit, you hit the person, they try and hit you back, you defend against that. You hit them again, they try and hit you back, you defend against that. So you could get successive hits on them, all of which might be wounding, all of which might be incapacitating, and they're not hitting you. And if they're not hitting you, then they're not incapacitating you, they're not wounding you. So on paper, the afterblow makes perfect sense and leads to perfect fences. But just like all rule sets, there's a problem. And the problem is... People aren't perfect and people don't train and behave as you expect them to do or as you would want them to do on paper. So what happens sometimes in reality is some rules, for example, say, OK, how should we treat the afterblow? Let's just give points for different point parts of the body, maybe four points for a head hit, one point or two points for an arm hit, um, four points for a thrust to the body, this kind of thing. And in that scenario... If you see that someone's, for example, attacking your leg, then in pure points, in pure sporting context, in terms of trying to win, of trying to accumulate points, what you could do if the, we have what's called fully weighted afterblow scoring, is if a person attacks your leg, you could completely ignore it and just hit them in the head. They will get maybe two points, you will get four points. But what's that teaching you? <laughs> yes, that is teaching you that uh, it's teaching both people that um, heads are often more important than legs, although not always. Many head hits don't result in much injury, and sometimes a leg hit could nick an artery and a person will be dead in minutes. But it is teaching a general trend for protecting your more vital targets, protecting against thrusts to the body and cuts to the head and things like this. But inadvertently, what it's also teaching you is accidentally to ignore certain hits to your limbs or even to receive a hit to give a hit. Now, this was very, very much, very vocally opposed um, in the Victorian period, for example, where someone like John Musgrave Waite says that unlike in boxing, this is paraphrasing, but he essentially says this, he says, unlike in boxing, where you can take hits and give hits, with sharp swords, there's none of that because if you receive a hit uh, and give a hit, you could both end up dead. And now that's true. Imagine the situation where someone cuts at your leg and you go, ah, it's only a leg, and cut at their head. What if you glance off their head and they cut your artery wide open or even chop your leg off? Uh, it's not impossible, or at least chop halfway through it so it's completely incapacitated. You with the chopped leg or the bleeding leg are now lying on the floor, slowly dying, and they might have a slight head injury and may be absolutely fine. So the problem is with fully weighted afterblows is that it inadvertently encourages people to receive a hit to give a hit and that's not what you want to be doing that's not the original idea of the afterblow the idea of the afterblow is to train the attacker to make sure that they defend themselves after they successfully hit it's never intended to be uh, supposed to train people to go, ah, it's fine to receive a hit so long as I give one back. And very unfortunately, because we're not fighting with sharp swords, because we're not fighting for real, there's no real risk of injury unless it's purely by accident, people want to hit more, the psychology is they want to hit the other person more than they care about being hit themselves. Because remember, when they're being hit themselves, the most they're going to get is a bruise, if that, most of the time. So psychologically, they get more of an endorphin rush. They get more of a, a kick out of hitting someone than they do out of protecting themselves. So accidentally, the afterblow rule can completely the opposite uh, do what you're intending to do. It can make people reckless and careless because they become obsessed with hitting the other person rather than 
um, not being hit. And where have you got to? You've got exactly back to stage one, where we were with the first person to hit wins the point. So the end result is the same. You end up with people who are kamikaze, are nonchalant about being hit, and are only thinking about hitting. So for that reason, there are other ways of dealing with the afterblow. Um, you can make the afterblow incredibly limited in terms of the time or the, the qualifiers for it. So one thing that I've done in the past uh, with fight camp rules, um, for example, is said that there is no afterblow allowed if you get thrust in the body or um, thrust or cut in the head. So for example, Therefore, if a person goes to a deep target, rather than sniping arms and legs or hands, if they go to a deep target and manage to thrust a person in the chest or hit them in the head, that person who's been hit first doesn't have the right to an afterblow. This seems to work okay. okay? I, I like that more than the fully weighted afterblow um, option. Uh, it's not perfect, no rules are, but it does seem to work better, at least in my experience. We've used that for several years. Um, and that seemed to work fairly well. The current system that we use at Fight Camp, which is another way of dealing with the afterblow, a different option, a different way of getting around these problems, is that we've said quite simply, an afterblow itself never scores points. Okay, so there's no point incentive to hitting second. The only thing that an afterblow does is reduces the points that the person who hit first gets. So the normal modifier is minus two. So for example, say you get five points for a head hit. So I'm fencing with someone, I manage to get in, hit them in the head, but as I'm coming out, they manage to hit my sword arm. In that scenario, I get five points for a head hit minus two because they hit me on the way out. Now on paper, this seems to work. Okay, uh, even in reality, this seems to work pretty well, I have to say, because it's not incentivizing people to hit second, it's mainly incentivizing people to not get hit after they've hit. So it seems to go back to the original motivator for having the afterblow. You're not rewarding afterblows themselves, what you're doing is slightly punishing the people who get hit by an afterblow after they've hit first. So the person who hits first is getting the points, the person who hits hit second is not getting the points, but it is rewarding the people who manage to hit and get out without being hit at any point. So in my mind, on paper, that's the closest to the, to the essence of why the afterblow is there. It's, it's teaching people that you can hit after being hit, it's teaching people that anybody could try and hit you after you've hit them, but if you manage to um, get in without being hit, hit them and get out again without being hit, then those, that is the ultimate goal and that's what the most points should be awarded for. So I'm quite happy with that system, but as I say, no rule set is perfect. And admittedly, where our rule set can fall down is um, on the subject of doubles and how we treat doubles. And the problem is that in the system whereby if you manage to hit someone and on the way out they manage to hit you, on paper, the person who hit first is getting some points, the person who hit second is getting zero points. So there's quite a disparity, as there should be on paper, because hitting second shouldn't really win you anything. But the problem is, if it's a double, then how do you treat that? Because if two people hit each other at the same time and you say, okay, that's zero points to both, that's a very big difference to one person scoring something and the other person scoring nothing. So we are still in the process of evolution and experimentation and trying to find that what the, the probably unattainable goal of the perfect sweet spot of how do we find the uh, division, the difference between doubles and afterblows. Now, I will probably talk more about doubles in a separate video because doubles are a problem unto themselves. I will only say this one thing uh, before I sign off and that is not all doubles are equal. In most rule sets, not all, but in most rule sets, doubles are treated as just doubles. But in reality, there are actually several different types of doubles. The, the main two types of doubles that I see happen 
uh, double hits that I see happen in tournaments and just friendly sparring are what I would call a pure double where essentially both people just happen to have attacked at the same time or just they both messed up and they just hit each other and it's both people's fault. That's the simple one to deal with. The other type of double is more complicated and that's what I term, um, in my club I refer to, as an asymmetrical double. And an asymmetrical double is quite simply where it was more one person's fault than the other, sometimes entirely one person's fault. And these are not an uncommon type of double. Unfortunately, it most often happens with a experienced fencer against an inexperienced fencer, or let's say a good fencer versus a bad fencer, where the good fencer does everything right and the bad fencer essentially behaves like they're happy to give their life away and just doubles. And if a person's willing to give up their life and willing to just go, ah, and just stick their weapon out and ignore everything that's going on, it's very difficult to fight against that. If someone doesn't care about dying, and obviously we're not actually dying because we're using safe weapons and competing in a sport, but if a person's willing to just take a hit to give a hit, it's very difficult to not double with them. Anyway, I'm going to finish off at that point, but really these are my current thoughts on afterblows. On paper, afterblows make perfect sense, but trying to put them into a rule set which can't be abused and doesn't lead to horrible results in the scores is really challenging and really difficult. And I would just reiterate again, I don't think that there is any perfect rule set I don't think that um, we will ever find a perfect rule set, probably. I don't think that we should have one unified rule set across all weapons in HEMA. I think that would be a bad thing for the martial art, even if it would be a good thing for the sport. And um, finally, I do think that the afterblow, in essence, on paper, is a good thing, but the way it's put into some rules can make it a bad thing and can actually make it a worse thing than just having no afterblow at all. So the afterblow is a good training aid if employed in the rules in the correct way. I hope that's been somewhat interesting and useful to some of you and thanks for watching. I'll see you for my next video. Cheers folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.